If you're a computer scientist or mathematician, you might mostly associate Alan Turing with theoretical or hypothetical Turing machines, a concept which set the path for the devices we know today. Outside computer science and math, Alan Turing is much more famous for cracking the Enigma code during World War II, being punished for homosexuality despite cracking the Enigma code during World War II, and the Turing test where humans try to tell the difference between humans and robots pretending to be humans. Today, I'd like to discuss the Turing test from the human's point of view. Let's think about it. Have you ever used a dating website? Y you know you're a human. Bear, bear with me, squidlings. But the person you're texting might turn out to be a robot sending you to a website. Have you ever used secret... Cam session? <laughs> I have a feeling you are not listening to me. It is an adult site that allows us to chat and even go live like Skype. My link is insert URL. I didn't ask. If you go there, my picture will load. I will destroy you. Yeah, you just click the accept invite button on the bottom left and it'll connect us. Because there are robots around and machine learning algorithms like GPT-3 can give robots quite convincing vocabularies. A human might mistake you for a robot, too. How can you convince them otherwise? In a Turing test, a human judge has a text conversation with a robot and a human, then votes on which they think is which. Robots try to be mistaken for humans. Brian Christian's book The Most Human Human covers the opposite angle. The human participants don't want to be mistaken for robots, but as robots get better and better, it's getting harder and harder to be human in comparison. Says Christian, there's a romantic notion, as a human confederate, of defending the human race, a la Garry Kasparov versus Deep Blue. Can the robots out-human the humans? Not on my watch, says Christian. But robots have an advantage. Human conversations are boring. Small talk is so robotic that robots can be charismatic by ignoring human rules. While humans try to avoid typos, robots can look like humans by using typos. While humans try to be polite, robots can look like humans by being assholes. While humans try to demonstrate their knowledge of language, robots can look like humans by pretending to be non-native speakers. These are super interesting all around, but I'm most interested in humans labeled bot. One cool example, one of the human confederates was Shakespeare expert Cynthia Clay, who was famously deemed a computer by three different judges. The consensus seemed to be, <laughs> no one knows that much about Shakespeare. Another, confederates too sometimes err on the epistolary side, writing way too much to actually have a conversation. After writing a very intelligent paragraph, this judge voted her a computer. Conversely, Christian also notices other humans being too coy. Instead of answering questions, they play cute. Asked what kind of engineer he is, Dave, to my left, answers, a good one, smiley face. Gotta have a conversation, Dave. But... Turing test conversations are usually made public, which can make it easier for shameless computers. When a judge asked a girl on a date, she had to answer vaguely, but that was actually very good evidence that she was a real human. So, so be it. A previous winner of the Most Human Human Award, Wired columnist Charles Platt, proved he wasn't a robot by being moody, irritable, and obnoxious. It kind of sounds like I'd rather talk to a robot. But Christian himself manages to win the Most Human Human Award just by thinking outside the box. He avoids cliches. He interrupts. He provides topics of conversation for the judge to latch onto. To look like a human instead of a robot, he learns the differences. Is chess one of those differences? Christian covers chess for a few chapters. I recommend reading this book, by the way. Or, if you can't be bothered, at least watch Down the Rabbit Hole's video on Deep Blue. Chess was once considered so complicated and so artful 
that only humans could understand it. In the first edition of Godelescher Bach, Douglas Hofstadter said, Profoundly insightful chess playing draws intrinsically on multiple facets of the human condition. All of these elusive abilities lie so close to the core of human nature itself, computers, mere brute force, will not be able to circumvent or shortcut that fact. Less than 20 years later, Deep Blue beat chess champion Garry Kasparov, and Douglas Hofstadter corrected himself. I vividly remember thinking to myself when I looked at it, uh-oh, the handwriting is on the wall, and so it was. It's debatable whether or not Deep Blue's victory was really humanity's last straw here. Deep Blue's chess-playing algorithms were coded by human chess champions, who studied Garry Kasparov themselves. But Garry Kasparov took notes from humans, too. All chess players research each other and consult each other. It's difficult to say where one chess player ends and his friends begin, just like it's difficult to say where a robot ends and the humans behind the robot begin. In fact, when Alan Turing first wrote about what we call computers today, he compared them to people, the computers of his era. Turing's paper, for instance, describes the unheard of digital computer by making analogies to a human computer. The idea behind digital computers may be explained by saying that these machines are intended to carry out any operations which could be done by a human computer. It turns out, the difference between humans, animals, and robots just keeps sliding. If all this isn't complicated enough yet, let's reverse the stakes. What if a human pretends to be a robot? Enter the Turk, a book by Tom Standage. In the 1700s, says Standage, elaborate mechanical toys were a popular form of entertainment in the courts of Europe. Wolfgang von Kempelen created a machine shaped like a Turkish bloke who could play chess, which battled Benjamin Franklin, Catherine the Great, Napoleon Bonaparte, Charles Babbage, and Edgar Allan Poe. This contraption, apparently capable of reason, sparked a vigorous debate about the extent to which machines could emulate or replicate human faculties. The Turk turned out to be a fraud, uh, with a man inside the box here. Read this book, by the way. But Standage presents the argument that Deep Blue is just a man in a box, too. American philosopher John Searle pointed out that the real competition was not between Kasparov and the machine but between Kasparov and a team of engineers and programmers. Deep Blue, like the Turk, relied on an illusion. It appeared to be a thinking machine, but effectively it had several human experts hiding inside it. Those human experts hiding inside it weren't even hiding, either. I never considered Deep Blue to be intelligent in any way, said Mary Campbell, one of its creators. It was painstakingly programmed every step of the way. So, on your dating website, or whatever, be nice to those robots. There's a, there's a human in there somewhere. <laughs> I'm not desperate. <laughs> I just enjoy talking to people online. <laughs> Especially via webcam. Do you webcam? You are not real! Oh, less than three. Are you signed up to any dating sites? I wanted to join Adult Friend Finder, but they charge too much. My mommy says I am not supposed to do that! As a final note, and I'm definitely thinking too much again, that's all I do here at Thanksgiving. Amazon has a web service called The Mechanical Turk, inspired by The Turk. I used this web service in one of my master's degree classes. You can set up questions to be answered by human people, because human people are better at answering those questions than computers. This can provide data sets for teaching a computer be more like a person. But these, these people aren't acting like people, are they? Amazon calls them artificial, artificial intelligence. These are humans pretending to be robots, which are pretending to be human, to help other robots pretend to be human. I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is Humans can teach humans, right? So sometimes, when a human speaks, that human isn't talking.
There's another human in there, talking through them. Turing tests have ultimately led us full circle. Cleverbot is pretty good at Turing tests because Cleverbot was trained by the whole internet. A conversation with Cleverbot can seem like talking to a person because it's actually more like talking to everyone at once. What's the difference between a human computer and a digital computer? Who speaks when you open your mouth? Well, I I'm not going to answer that for you. Bye-bye. By the way, I've got a Patreon at patreon.com slash thinkster. I want to thank all these squidlings and elder squids. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>